Premier League top teams are making a mistake by underesting Manchester United and it could cost them by the end of the season. The Premier League is now in full gear once again and the league table is gradually shaping up. Manchester City, Liverpool, Arsenal, Aston Villa, Newcastle and, surprisingly, Brighton have had incredible starts to the season. However, Manchester United are ready to kick on against these top teams. How? Well, they've given their coach, Eric Ten Hag, full transfer freedom and have been stacking up on the kind of players that made Ten Hag surprise Europe with his Ajax team. Something is brewing at Manchester United. Now, this isn't the first time Man U have given Ten Hag the freedom to sign who he wants or is familiar with, and that didn't turn out so good with the signing of, for example, Anthony. So what's different this time around? Well, we'll get to that later in the video. United look to have turned around their nervous start to the 24-25 season. They beat Southampton decisively in the league and have crushed Barnsley in the League Cup with a resounding 7-0 win. The team seem to be slowly moving past their most heart-pounding last couple of weeks in the 23-24 season of the Premier League, which ended with them finishing 8th and with a negative goal difference. They were equally bad in the Champions League, and despite being in a group with Bayern, Copenhagen and Galatasaray, United only managed to win four points. They were eliminated from the Champions League in the group stages, and many United fans would agree it was a sackable offence. United performed well in the 22-23 season, so how did they not build on it and make a greater impact at the highest level? And why? Did that happen? Well, United explored the market in the 23-24 summer transfer window to build on their impressive 22-23 season. They signed Mason Mount, who Ten Hag wanted because of his ability to press and his similarities to how Donny van der Beek, one of Ten Hag's former players, played. They also reunited him with Sofyan Amrabat, who he worked with at Ajax. But still, it wasn't enough, and we'll get around to why soon. Ten Hag signing players he was familiar with wasn't a failure. It's a major reason he still has the job too. Well, how? Well, so, while United performed poorly in the league, they were better in the FA Cup. I mean, slightly better, that is. United had an inspiring performance against Liverpool in the quarterfinals, and they scored early, but were unable to dominate proceedings fully. Liverpool equalised and went ahead before United pulled a miraculous equaliser off just before the final whistle was blown. That match was packed with excitement and if fans thought that was the peak of it, they wouldn't see what would happen next in the extra time coming. With that equaliser, United were in another gear in extra time. Liverpool too wanted to win the FA Cup and give their beloved fist-pumping and charismatic Jurgen Klopp a befitting send-off. Liverpool scored again and then United equalised before completing their comeback in the very final moments of the game. United were to play Coventry United during the semi-finals and the expectation was it would be an easy tie. But it was anything but. United did everything almost perfectly in that game. They scored three goals and were in control up until the 60th minute before chaos ensued. They lost total control of the game and ended up playing extra time and penalties against Coventry. They're likely not going to lose control of a game again. Now they've found the key to their midfield problems and you'll soon see what we mean. They eventually went on to beat Coventry during penalties but couldn't truly enjoy their win. It never should have gotten to extra time and the Coventry attackers one inch offside is the only reason United eventually went through. And then they were faced with the bigger task. They needed to beat Man City in the final. The verdict was the same from fans on that one. It would be an easy City win. Except it wasn't. And it was because of the winning goal from Kobi Mainu, the youngster Ten Hag promoted to the first team. Amrabat, who Ten Hag worked with at Ajax, complimented Mainu in that match. For the second season in a row, United had won a trophy after going on a six-year trophy drought. This was an immense feat considering the club's trajectory and Ten Hag knew it. Two trophies in two seasons and three finals. Not bad. If they don't want me anymore, I'll go somewhere else and win trophies. That's what I do. Ten Hag was right 
That is what he does, and he's been doing it every year since he became Ajax's coach. It's impressive, but does winning any old trophy make it a successful season for United? What is the true measure of success for a club and a coach? Is it the trophies they've won, the revolutionary concepts they introduced, or how well they played in the league? Arsene Wenger was an impactful coach for not only Arsenal, but the whole league. He introduced concepts that changed how everyone saw football, a new style of play, a better way to train and focus on diets. Wenger led Arsenal to historic success, but he still continued to be regarded as an elite coach after leading Arsenal on a trophy drought. To Pep Guardiola, Arrigo Sacchi was a great coach. Sacchi didn't win titles like Sir Alex, but he changed generations of managers and players, Pep said. This was high praise coming from Pep. So, can Ten Hag be described as successful? Well, United finished 8th in the league table, the lowest they've finished in a long while. They would have missed out completely on Europe if they hadn't won the FA Cup. To Ten Hag, it was enough and was still a success. Former Man U coach Ole Gunnar Solskjaer sees things differently and believes the true measure of a coach's success is their league performance. Maybe this is why Mikel Arteta has been given a new contract at Arsenal. Since his first season with Arsenal, Arteta hasn't won anything, but he undoubtedly has revived the club. There is cohesion, they play a fluid football which is similar to that of Wenger's, and they had the opportunity to win the league twice, only being undone by their squad depth and, some even say, their mentality. Gunners fans can see improvement and believe winning the league is just a matter of time. Apart from the trophies they won, United have been accused of not having a structure when they play. Now that may be an unfair assessment. United do have a structure, just not what fans and United legends thought Ten Hag would bring. Ten Hag was called the crown prince of modern Dutch coaching even before he began to coach Ajax in 2017. He earned that title after years of putting in the work and learning the ins and outs of being a manager. Ten Hag began his career as a coach by working with the youngsters at FC20 when he retired as a centre-back in 2002. He was a thorough coach and soon it became clear that Ten Hag's ideals, while great for shaping youngsters, were better suited to professionals at the senior level and he was promoted to the first team as an assistant in 2006. Ten Hag began to work with the first team coach at the time, Fred Rutten, and began absorbing knowledge, waiting for that time when he would become a head coach. Rutten left for Schalke in 2008, but Ten Hag remained and served as the new coach, Steve McLaren's assistant. When McLaren resumed as coach, Ten Hag welcomed him with six sheets of notes and suggestions and still brought more. Ten Hag's hard work impressed McLaren, who could now easily adapt to his new job, and the results showed during the season with 20, fighting for the title against Louis van Gaal's AZ Alkmaar. They didn't win, but they came in a respectable second. It was an epic display from 20, but after several years with 20, Ten Hag left under bad terms. He went to PSV to meet up with Rutten again before finally joining Go Ahead Eagles in the second division of the Dutch league in 2012 and did something incredible. Go Ahead Eagles had been languishing in the second division for several years, but Ten Hag returned them to the first division. It was an incredible feat, which meant he didn't remain with the club. An offer from Germany came and Ten Hag could hardly resist. Bayern Munich made him the coach of their reserve team in 2013. It was around this period that he met the man who he would compete against in the Premier League, Pep Guardiola. Ten Hag left Bayern in 2015 to become the sporting director and head coach of Utrecht. Ten Hag had an immediate impact with the team and his leadership didn't go unnoticed. He won the Manager of the Year award at the end of his first season and after two years with Utrecht, Ajax came calling in December 2017. The crown prince of Dutch football was now truly home, the club where the essence of Dutch football had first developed. In the 2017-18 season, his first with Ajax, Ten Hag did the unthinkable. He made his team giant slayers. 
Ajax beat the defending champions Real Madrid in front of their fans at the Santiago Bernabeu in that season's Champions League. They beat Juventus in front of their fans too in the quarterfinals to proceed to the semi-finals. They beat Tottenham Hotspur in their completed Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. However, Tottenham turned the deficit around and eliminated Ajax from the Champions League on aggregate. Reaching the semis that season would be Ajax's first since 1997, and the quality of teams they beat made their Champions League campaign even more breathtaking. How did Ten Hag's Ajax achieve these victories? Well, Ten Hag worked with a core of young talents, like Matthias de Ligt, Frankie de Jong, Donny van der Beek, David Neres, and the older Dusan Tadic and Hakim Ziyech. Ten Hag is now doing his best to recreate this Ajax side by signing many of the squad for Man United. During that run and his first season in charge, Ten Hag played with a 4-2-3-1 formation, and the emphasis was on not just attacking, but also having possession of the ball. He played with four defenders with his centre-backs, one of them De Ligt, who's now with him at United, being comfortable on the ball, starting play from the back. His full-backs, one of them being his current player, Nusser Mazraoui, inverted into the midfield to serve as link between Ajax's back line and double pivot while also providing attacking support. Their wingers then cut inside either to serve as a second striker or perform creative duties. Then, the attacking midfielder, Donny van der Beek, was allowed to roam into areas where there was space. Coupled with their relentless pressing, this allowed Ajax to feel as if they were everywhere on the pitch. They overcrowded the insides of the pitch, which allowed them the opportunity to pass and retain possession and quickly get the ball back when they lost it. The next season... Ten Hag was forced to change how they played as he had lost key members of his team due to their Champions League campaign. He now played with a 4-3-3. However, this time one of the fullbacks stayed back to make the formation a back three and the other, which was Masrowi, made attacking runs forward while also moving infield with the wingers keeping the width and the two box-to-box -box midfielders making supporting runs for the striker. To prevent the team from being stretched, Ten Hag used a destroyer defensive midfielder in Edson Alvarez, who could cover spaces left when the team attacked. This is similar to what Ten Hag intends to do with one of their new signings. Ten Hag's system, despite the change, still emphasised ruthless attack and it helped him win his first trophy, the 2018-19 KNVB Cup in 2019 and then the league title a few days after. Once he won his first trophy, Ten Hag had a taste for victory and he got addicted. He pushed his team to do more and won more league titles in the 2020-21 and 21-22 seasons and it still wasn't enough. Ajax also won the 2020-21 KNVB Cup and reached the final of the cup in the 21-22 season, narrowly losing to PSV. Ten Hag clearly has an incredible winning mentality and with his achievements with Ajax and his playing style which rivaled Pep Guardiola's, Man United decided to hire him. What could possibly go wrong? Enjoying his employment, Ten Hag boasted when he got to United that City's era had come to an end. Well, it hasn't. Instead, what has happened was Eric Ten Hag deciding to depart from his style that won him trophies at Ajax to a more direct approach. Now, why would he do that? Well, it's all Brentford and Brighton's fault. Speaking of Brighton, click in the top right to watch our video on Brighton's great start to the season and subscribe while you're there if you enjoy the channel. In Ten Hag's first season, the 22-23 season, United lost to these two teams despite him playing his Ajax style. After those defeats, Ten Hag changed how United approached games. He switched to a direct style based on quick wing play, which has been played at United since Sir Matt Busby's teams of the 1950s and 60s. Sir Alex Ferguson also played the same style and he won two European Cups, 13 Premier League titles, five FA Cups, four League Cups, the European Cup Winners' Cup, the European Super Cup, the Intercontinental Cup and the FIFA Club World Cup. Just like the style did for those legendary United managers, it worked for Ten Hag too as he went on a decent winning run. He didn't want to do the same thing Louis van Gaal did that got him sacked. 
Van Gaal changed from United's wing play and quick counter-attacks to possession football, which just didn't seem attractive to either the fans or the players. Ten Hag understood that United couldn't play his style early on. They weren't comfortable building from the back. As good as De Gea was, he was a pure traditional goalkeeper and couldn't help but build from the back. Maguire had confidence issues, with signings Rafael Varane and Lissandro Martinez being the most comfortable defenders to pass from the back. Former United fullback Aaron Wan Bissaka was more defence orientated and was not really good in making attacking contributions. In the midfield, Bruno Fernandes isn't also big on retaining the ball and takes risks while in possession with his insistence on always making a forward pass. Casemiro, who United also signed during Ten Hag's first season, was better at destroying and tackling than ball retention. He was also on the older side of 30, which made him unable to cover spaces in the midfield like an Edson Alvarez. Now do you see why Ten Hag had to adapt? Despite changing styles, United won 42 games out of 62 and lost 12 times. They scored 115 goals and conceded 69. Their performance earned them a third place finish and they got to the final of that season's FA Cup, which they lost, but they did win the League Cup. It was a bright start for United under the new coach. However, things got bad in the following 23-24 season. United were active in the transfer window that season. They reunited Ten Hag with Sofian Amrabat and signed Mason Mount, a player similar to former Ajax player Donny van der Beek in skill set. Slowly, Ten Hag was rebuilding his Ajax team. His wingers, Alejandro Garnacho, Marcus Rashford, Anthony and Amadiallo were the pacey types of wingers he'd used at Ajax. However, United weren't quite there yet. Injuries hit the squad badly. They were without Lissandro Martinez and Varane for the majority of the season. The same went for their new signing Mount and Casemiro. The injuries allowed Maguire, an outcast at the time, to make a return. It also helped youngster Kobi Mainu have a solid run in the first team. And then just as they dealt with the problems on field, there was drama off it too, as United were looking for new individuals to buy a stake in the team. After a long, protracted saga, Ineos were eventually able to do so after months of back and forth, and they assumed control over the team's footballing operations. While United concluded that ownership situation, their on-the-pitch personnel problem exposed them. Their new direct system allowed them to press high and also form a low defensive block, exposing the central and defensive midfielders as they had too much space to cover. Ten Hag insisted on it and wouldn't change his mind. In the end, his stubbornness paid off as United won the FA Cup. Rather than part ways with Ten Hag, as had been heavily trailed in the press, Ineos decided to continue with him. They saw something other teams in the Premier League didn't see that made them believe United were closer to dominating once again. When Ten Hag was at Ajax, he had Sebastian Haller, who's a target man and more. United had already bought Rasmus Hoyland, but they needed a profile that did more than just goal scoring, just like Haller was for Ten Hag at Ajax. They wanted a player that would drop deep from the centre-forward position and contribute to build-up while still also making forward runs and occupying the box. So they signed Joshua Zerksy, who'd scored 11 and created another five goals and only missed four big chances in 34 appearances for Bologna in Serie A. United recognised that their midfield was too stretched and it exposed them to opponents far too much. They conceded 444 shots, with only the relegated Luton and Sheffield United conceding more. So to solve this problem, they went ahead to sign the out-of-favour PSG player Manuel Ugarte. Ugarte had incredible stats for PSG. Despite only playing 21 times in Ligue 1, Ugarte ended the season being in the 92nd percentile for ball recoveries. He also was in the 92nd percentile for interceptions and the midfielder is in the 78th percentile for defending intensity. Already, this is beyond impressive, but there's more. Ugarte attempted 4.6 tackles per game, with only Bayern's new defensive midfielder, Jao Palinha, averaging more, with 
Out of his attempted tackles, Ugarte won 2.7, with his figure being the best in Ligue 1. So have United signed the new Roy Keane? Check out our video here on this subject. Moving on to the defence, United also recruited heavily. They signed De Ligt, who Ten Hag has worked with before, highly rated youngster Lenny Yoro and right fullback Masroi. These defenders share a key trait. They're all incredible on the ball. So now there's less reliance on Lissandro Martinez. Now United have made all these signings and have reunited Ten Hag with two more of his players from Ajax. So how does this help them become better? Ten Hag for United lines up his team with a 4-2-3-1 formation. However, he can be contradictory with his tactics. While he emphasises on the team being more direct and pressing high up the pitch, he also doesn't want to give away the ball cheaply to opponents by playing long balls from the back to the striker like a direct team should. Instead, Ten Hag wants his team to also take the initiative by starting to play from the back. Andre Onana now has better passing options in Lissandro Martinez, Lenny Yoro and Matthias De Ligt. Those three aren't just centre-backs, they have incredible vision, which allows them to pick out a player with any kind of pass. Martinez and Yoro are especially good at this. They also have abilities to retain the ball, which makes it less likely for them to lose it when the opponents press them. Their full-backs, Masraoui and Dallo, who's filling in for a yet again injured Luke Shaw, also are technically secure and have an attack-first mindset. They defend on the front foot by pressing opponents and their true strength lies when they're in the opponent's half, when they can do damage with their passes. Masraoui, like he did at Ajax, can also invert into the midfield to help United deal with their issues of being too stretched. This would in turn help Ugarte, who's not as solid on the ball as United's defenders, and his would-be midfield partner, Kobi Mainu. Mainu, while he is good at closing down spaces and pressing, is better suited to a box-to-box -box midfield role, which allows him to use his stamina and technical abilities for the team. By playing with Ugarte and an inverting Masroi, Mainu can better utilise his creativity without thinking of what would happen if he loses possession. Now, while he isn't as great on the ball, Ugarte is elite at closing down spaces and recovering the ball back to set up a quick counter. He will help Mainu serve as a better link with the attack, and Bruno Fernandes wouldn't have to drop so deep for United. Bruno's better when he plays with the striker, as he is very direct, but there's something more he can give in this new United team. He has incredible timing and can score goals, so he could also double as a sort of second striker, due to the nature of United striker Hoyland and Xerxes, who can both press and have decent passing abilities and can also finish. Ten Hag can slowly revert to his Ajax style in the next couple of years, which was less direct and didn't allow opponents to have a sniff of the ball. If he's still there, that is.